O hu o hu ka mau na itale o hi ala ka la au pua ula hiki na ke a komo hana komo ka o hu ka hana komo apa na hana ta o hu e ho o hu ite ala o hi a o hu ka ni o hi a ve hi wa no hotu a hi o hu o hu mu mu ka wa hi ne no ho mau na o hu pa hi o i ka paliku ka wa ha wa ha paliku i ka pa ma ka ni ku ma ku a. Hakalita o hulewa ia e kalawa e Haka ano o leke ia o hunoke noke Hakala la ke kia manu ita o hu ita o hi aha mau Mai ho aha mau ita leo ka lehu a pane A pane mai pahai te ia mamo e I need to begin by acknowledging my training in dual worlds. I graduated out of Western Academia as a PhD ecologist, and I've enjoyed a 35-year career in conservation in Hawaii. I was also traditionally trained by a remarkable master of chant and ceremony, Kumujan Keola Maka Ainana Lake, who put me through the uniki rites of passage to emerge as a kahuna ka kalaleo, a Hawaiian chant practitioner. This dual training is pivotal in what I want to share today. It's a story of salvation of the world in the microcosm that exists in the remarkable archipelago called Hawaii. The Hawaiian Islands can boast more ecological diversity in a single location than any place on Earth. And I've had the great privilege and joy of exploring this diversity from end to end of the island chain. Far from the cliché of white sandy beaches and swaying palm trees, in Hawaii you can go from geologically fresh, gentle, uncarved slopes to the tallest sea cliffs in the world. From lands that were created just this morning, barren and devoid of life, to climax forests supporting thousands of species. From cinder lands as dry as any of the world's deserts to arguably the wettest spot on Earth. From coastal dunes at sea level to snow-capped volcanic summits just shy of 14,000 feet. Couple this remarkable habitat diversity with extreme isolation, and you'll find the species that evolved here are unlike anywhere else on the planet, co-adapted and balanced and forming an amazing array of ecosystems. The Holdridge Life Zone system is one of the classic ways of cataloging global ecosystem diversity. 38 different life zones are used to comprise the full range of habitats on the planet, uh, life zones such as uh, tropical rainforest, frozen tundra, super arid desert, temperate steppe, and so on. So now let's do an unfair comparison. Brazil, the largest country on the continent of South America, spanning 40 degrees of latitude, over eight and a half million square kilometers, from the heart of the Amazon to the foothills of the Andes, it packs a hefty 17 Hodges life zones. That's the, that's the record for the continent of South America. Hawaii, in comparison, four degrees of latitude, less than 17,000 square kilometers, and yet comprised of 27 Holdridge life zones. Let's hear it for Hawaii. <laughs> it is the single most habitat-rich place on the planet. Put another way, um, if you wanted to choose one place on Earth to represent the full range of ecosystems that the planet can offer, it would be the Hawaiian Islands. So rather than looking at Hawaii as tropical and insular, which are kind of limited uh, ways to look at things, here's another way to look at it. Just about any terrestrial life form on Earth could find its optimal conditions, its sweet spot, somewhere in the Hawaiian Islands. And that meant awesome opportunities for our Hawaiian ancestors that arrived in the islands about a millennium ago. For a thousand years, they not only survived, but thrived, achieving populations rivaling those of today, yet completely independent from the rest of the world. Creating one of the pinnacles of Polynesian societies, excelling at a wide range of arts. A thousand years of fine-tuning to this remarkable island environment, and then, contact with the Western world. Post-contact history has not been kind to either Hawaiian ecosystems or Hawaiian culture. I've dedicated my life to the preservation and management 
of the remarkable biocultural diversity that exists in these islands. And part of my task is to know what we had, what we've lost, and what remains. Through the science of landscape ecology, we actually have a good idea of the remarkable range of ecosystems that once covered these islands from coast to summit. In the times before people with 100% native ecosystems, through the era of pre-contact Hawaii, say 300 years ago, pink is where people lived and worked. Pink is where they displaced the ecosystems, establishing their own ecological footprint on the land. Against our footprint of today, huge and blithely, grindingly destructive, a scant 235 years after Cook encountered the islands in 1778, and 85% of our native ecosystem cover has been lost. And at the same time, our self-sufficiency has plummeted to 15% or less. That means that 85% or more of our needs are imported these days. And if that importation of goods were to stop, we are just three weeks from famine. It bears repeating. Footprint of less than 15% back then against 70% or more today, and 100% self-sufficiency back then against less than 15% today. When we were doing this Hawaiian footprint project, my academic self of reveling in the multidisciplinary combination of archaeology, plant physiology, geospatial modeling, and topographic uh, analyses, but my, my traditional training allowed me to delve deeply into the ancient knowledge systems. Um, th these were describing the islands before 1778, the native Hawaiian descriptions of the agricultural areas, the fish ponds, the religious sites, the trails, the storied localities, the centers of chiefly governance, and all the other areas of traditional use. And those, that information corroborated the academic findings like magic, and it confirmed the light Hawaiian footprint on all islands. So what was it that allowed hundreds of thousands of people to thrive in a limited island system without destroying their environment or losing their self-sufficiency? In the ancient Hawaiian universe, there was a dichotomy. The realm of people, the Wau Kanaka, was in the lowlands, and that which grew there did so as a result of human effort. Above this comfortable lowland zone was the Wawakua, the realm of the gods, where human effort had nothing to do with the verdant growth of native forest and providing the fresh water that flowed out of it. As an intensely sacred place, it was subject to kapu, a sacred restrictions on behavior. And that resulted in 15% or less of the land being impacted to provide for 100% of human needs, precisely because kapu preserved essential ecological services. The respect that was afforded the Wawakua was not a fear of godly wrath. Aumakua are ancestor gods, and Hawaiians hold that Aumakua can take the form of native plants and animals. Such a form is a kino lau, a physical manifestation of a deity. When the gods are also your family, and the elements of nature their physical presence, your relationship with nature is fundamentally transformed. To see ourselves as connected to other living things is so much richer than seeing ourselves as consumers and the world as made up of commodities. Of all of the Hawaiian traditional values, the one most globally recognized today is aloha. Aloha. Empathetic compassion. Love. The aloha that you extend to family extends further in Hawaiian thought to all of, the, all of the elements of nature around you in your aina, the lands of your place, and emerges as aloha aina, a deep appreciation and love for all the features of the land, such that you realize that you are not whole without your place, and that the fate and health of your place is your own fate, your own health. When you have this kind of relationship with the aina, it's impossible to reconcile the aloha that you hold with the idea of land as property. To gain from the land without thought to the benefit of the land would be a direct and conscious prostitution of not only a family member, but an elder. And what right-thinking person would do that? Without aloha aina, it's all too easy to dismiss the land as wasted if it's not put to highest and best use. And modern ideas of such use have been so patently single-minded. If we have learned one thing out of land use history in Hawaii, it is this. Any formula for land use 
that replaces huge native diversity for a single thing, be it cows, pineapples, or tourists, will ultimately destroy the foundation upon which our lives and identity depend. Identity. In 1976, the Hawaiian voyaging canoe Hokulea sailed without modern navigational aids from Hawaii to Tahiti, over 2,600 miles of open ocean, demonstrating that Hawaiians could navigate fast oceanic distances with only the stars, the currents, and the observations of the world around them as their guide. When they arrived in Papete Harbor to throngs of thousands, it was clear that they had ignited a spark of a powerful cultural renaissance, inspiring hope in Hawaiians and setting them on a course to recapture the knowledge and skills that created not only ecological sustainability, but a remarkably rich society. Now, about 40 years later, Hokulea has set out on a voyage around the world, spreading aloha and a call to care for our planet, our island, our canoe. We need to demonstrate that the Hawaiian values and relationships that they are sharing are indeed a worthy model for our island Earth. Hokulea's sister vessel, Hikianalia, accompanies the worldwide voyage with the latest and advanced technologies, solar panels, satellite tracking, live internet updates, to travel in parallel with traditional Hawaiian wayfinding. This blend of old and new can be our salvation in Hawaii, and by extension, the world. Just as Hawaiian-born astronaut Lacey Veach took a symbol of ancient Hawaiian technology into space, floating a Hawaiian stone ads in zero G while the islands were in view below. So we can move forward with the best that science can offer in renewable energy, in food production, in conservation biology, to undo the damage of the past and to restore the health of our ecosystems. Basing our actions on the best of ancient values, values that ring true, especially today. Lessons of island self-sufficiency, of reverent relationships between people and the lands and waters that sustain them, and between each other as collective kahu, caretakers of the planet. We need to raise the consciousness of those around us, even as we raise our own, to understand the full sacredness of our world and our relationship with it, doing everything we can to lighten our collective footprint. Without that, the world is heading to a place we all do not want to be. But with those relationships and with those values, we can take that which makes our place unique and beautiful and spread that around the world, so that no matter where you are, that which makes your place unique and beautiful becomes the source of your aloha aina. And so bearing that in your minds and hearts, aloha.